uh, with fracking is to come up with methods to reduce water contamination and some kind of way to help prevent the uh, the destabilization of the rock formations due to the fracking and help reduce the uh, odds of there being seismic activity as a result. And so the next question deals with methane obtained during fracking or or from uh, coal extraction methods. Uh, methane has a heat of combustion of 50.1 kilojoules per gram. So methane has a higher heat of combustion than coal. Coal's heat of combustion, as we saw in a previous problem, is about 30. So methane, natural gas, has a higher heat of combustion than coal. So it puts off more heat um, than coal does. So how much CO2 is produced when natural gas, assuming that it's 100% methane, is burnt to produce 1,500 kilojoules of heat. So we know the heat of combustion of methane. We also know how much heat is given off. So we need to know the mass of CO2 that's produced when the methane is burned. So with these types of problems, you, you of course always want to start off with the balanced chemical reaction. We're talking about a combustion reaction. So we should be very familiar with writing those at this point, knowing that the products are going to be CO2 and water. The reactants are going to be your hydrocarbon, in this case, methane, and of course, oxygen. So then, of course, we also need to make sure we get, we're starting off with a balanced equation. And so, we always want to balance the carbons first, and they're already balanced. So next, balance the hydrogens. And then finally, balance the oxygens. So now that we have a balanced equation, we see that there is a one-to-one -one molar ratio in our balanced equation between the methane and the CO2. So now that we know the heat of combustion of methane, that's your delta H, we know the heat, that's our Q. And so remember the equation that Q is equal to the delta H times the mass of the fuel. In this case, the fuel is methane. So we know Q, we know delta H, so we can solve for mass of the methane. It's going to be equal to Q divided by the delta H. So solve for the mass of methane. And then you're going to use your flow chart. I know my mass of reactant. After we find the mass of the methane, we'll know the mass of the reactant in, in grams. And then we just need to follow the flow chart, convert the grams of reactant to moles of reactant. Use your one to one mole ratio to convert moles of our reactant CH4 to moles of CO2, our product and then convert the moles of CO2 to grams of CO2 using the molar mass of CO2, which is 44 grams per mole. And so this problem is very similar to the one that we did previously, dealing with coal and combusting just carbon. But this time we're combusting CH4. That's the only difference in the way this problem works and the previous one that we did. So does anyone have an answer for the mass in grams for CH4?
So we have our kilojoules canceling. And we do the math. So we have 29.9 grams of methane. So now we just need to do a series of conversions. Methane CH4 has a molar mass of 12 for carbon, four uh, hydrogens, each at about one gram per mole. So that's about 16.04 grams per mole. So now the grams of CH4 cancel. So now our mole ratio from our balance equation, there's one mole of CH4 for every one mole of CO2. So now moles of CH4 can cancel. So now we need to convert the moles of CH4 to grams of CH4. I'm sorry, CO2, moles of CO2 to grams of CO2 by using the molar mass of CO2. And now the moles of CO2 cancel. So I'm doing the math, 29.9 times 44 divided by 16.04. you get 82.1 grams of CO2. And so in our picture here, when we looked at how the oil is squeezed from the sandstone rock formations by CO2 displacing the oil out, squeezing uh, the oil out due to high pressure, uh, that high pressure water CO2 mixture. And so when that oil comes up to the surface, it is crude oil and it contains many, many, many different components. It contains alkanes, which are hydrocarbons that only have single bonds, like our methane, ethane, propane, butane, pentane, so on and so forth. But there's also alkenes, which are also hydrocarbons that have at least one double bond. And there are also alkynes, hydrocarbons that have at least one triple bond. And so to name hydrocarbons, you use your Greek prefixes. Uh, for those uh, hydrocarbons having five or greater carbons. For those having one through four carbons, we talked about the mother eats peanut butter mnemonic, MEPB. So those first four are methane, ethane, propane, and butane. The others starting with five carbons will have your Greek prefix beginnings, uh, penta for pentane, uh, hex for hexane, hept for heptane, so on and so forth. And then the ending of the name of the hydrocarbon is going to tell you whether or not it's a hydrocarbon that has all single bonds. It'll have the ending A-N-E. -E. If the hydrocarbon has at least one double bond, it'll have the E-N-E -E ending. Or if the hydrocarbon has at least one triple bond, it'll have the Y-N-E -E ending. And so all of these different hydrocarbons that make up crude oil are very volatile. That, that means that they easily get converted from a liquid to a gas. And so having high volatility equals a lower boiling point usually than water. So like if you 
have your rubbing alcohol that you bought from the drugstore and you leave the top off of it. And let's say the bottle is about a quarter of the way, only a quarter of the way full. Just, and you leave the cap off of it and you go on vacation for a week or two. When you come back, a considerable amount, if not all, of that alcohol is going to be evaporated. Because if you don't put the cap back on, that putting that cap on keeps it under pressure. And so it keeps it, of course, from evaporating. And so not under pressure, not with the cap on, that alcohol is going to evaporate at room temperature, especially if it's in the winter time and you leave your heat running while you're gone on vacation as well. And so what causes something to go from the liquid phase to the gas phase? Well, that has to be a disruption of the intermolecular forces that are holding those liquid molecules in close proximity to each other and therefore attracted to each other. We talked uh, earlier about one type of intermolecular force called the hydrogen bond that exists between a hydrogen atom of one molecule and either an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine atom in a neighboring molecule. Well, there's another intermolecular force called London dispersion forces. Hydrocarbons have these types of intermolecular uh, forces that exist between them. So for example, let's take mercury as an example. Mercury CH4. And so we talked about, when, when we're talking about hydrogen bonding, we're set, we were talking about how in a bond that's covalent, and this is a covalent bond between two non-metal atoms, carbon and hydrogen. Well, if the two atoms are different and carbon and hydrogen are different from each other, they have different electronegativities. And so carbon has a slightly higher not a whole lot higher, but slightly higher. I think hydrogen is two, electronegativity of 2.1. And if I recall correctly, carbon's electronegativity is like 2.4. So there's a slight difference in electronegativity. So carbon is slightly more electronegativity, electronegative. And so it's going to pull a little bit more of that electron density and that CH bond towards itself. So carbon is going to carry a partial negative charge. Hydrogen will carry a partial positive charge. So they, therefore, the partial positive charge on hydrogen in one methane molecule is going to be attracted to the partial negative charge on the carbon atom in a neighboring methane molecule. And that is your London dispersion force. And so this picture here just pretty much demonstrates what I demonstrated with my methane example. You have a partial plus charge on one hydrocarbon attracted to a partial negative charge on a carbon atom in a neighboring hydrocarbon molecule. And so this crude oil having all of these different hydrocarbons mixed together. Well, what all refineries do is separate all the different hydrocarbons from each other based on the number of carbons that the hydrocarbons have through a process called fractional distillation. And so what you have here is a boiler and the crude oil goes into this boiler. And these are extremely hot temperatures. And so what that boiler does is take that liquid crude oil and vaporizes everything because of these extreme hot temperatures. It's gonna take all that liquid as well as solid uh, sludge components in the crude oil and turn all of it into a vapor. 
and then all that vapor is going to leave the boiler and go into this distillation tower. And so at the bottom of the tower is your hot, hottest temperatures, greater than 400 degrees Celsius. That's hot. So that's the hottest temperature area of the tower. As you go up to the top, the temperature decreases the further you go up to the top of the tower. So at the very top, the temperatures are cool, less than 40 degrees Celsius at the top, greater than 400 degrees Celsius at the bottom. So therefore, your heaviest hydrocarbons, the one that has the most carbons, those are going to require the hottest temperatures in order for them to condense. So that's the whole purpose of this tower is to cause condensation. And of course, condensation is taking something from a gas and converting it back to a liquid. Because remember the boiler, you go from liquid to gas. In the distillation tower, you're going back to liquid. Okay. And so those hydrocarbons that have greater than 20 carbons, they'll, uh, they'll need to be condensed here at the hottest temperatures because they have the greatest number of carbons. They have the bigger molar mass. So they're going to have the higher boiling point. So the greater the number of carbons, a hydrocarbon, which I'll abbreviate HC, the higher the boiling point. Now I'm abbreviating boiling point BP. So the greater the number of carbons that a hydrocarbon has, the greater its boiling point. So therefore, it is going to, uh, therefore, the boiling point and the condensation point temperature is the same thing. And so therefore, in order to condense those hydrocarbons that have greater than 20 carbons, you're going to have to be at the hottest temperatures. So those greater than 20 carbons will condense here at the very bottom. And then those lightest hydrocarbons that have between one and four carbons, they're going uh, to condense at the cooler temperatures. So coming out at the very top of the carbon of the tower are going to be those hydrocarbons that have between one and four carbons. And those will stay as a mixture of what people call refinery gases. Then those that have between five and 12 carbons, they'll come off the tower next from the top to the bottom. And they'll go through a device called a reformer. <coughs> and what the reformer does, because of course in the United States, we need crude oil mainly for transportation purposes. So for gasoline, what the reformer does is takes this mixture of hydrocarbons that ranges from five to 12 carbons and turns it all into gasoline. Basically turns it all into octane. Turns it all into hydrocarbons having eight carbons. And then next you have Hydrocarbons ranging between 12 and 16 carbons, that's your jet fuel. Between 14 and 16 carbons is your diesel fuel. And then having between 15 and 18 carbons and between 16 and 20 carbons, they go through this special device called a cracker. And what the cracker does is uses hot temperatures and or a catalyst. And they'll break these large hydrocarbons having um, between 15 and 20 carbons, breaking them up into smaller pieces. And so therefore you get your refinery gases having between one and four carbons. You get more gasoline, um, more jet fuel, more diesel fuel. So basically there's not a big need for these big huge hydrocarbons having between 15 and 20 carbons. And so you basically break them apart into smaller pieces, smaller hydrocarbon pieces, which end up being your refinery gases, gasoline, jet fuel, and diesel. And then finally, your greater than 20 carbon hydrocarbons, they go through uh, what's called a coker. And what that does is it removes all residual gas uh, from the substance because it's now like a sludge 
uh, because uh, it's going to be mostly in solid state. And so therefore, uh, that's how you get your asphalt that we use to pave our roads with. And keeping it hot, it stays liquid, as we know. But once they uh, lay that asphalt down, it's no longer in that machine that's keeping it hot, then it's going to solidify, as we know, and that's how we get our roads. And then also coming out of uh, the coker is going to be your industrial fuels and your lubricants like your WD-40 and your motor oils and things of that nature. And so if we have these three hydrocarbons, pentane has five carbons, triacontane has 30 carbons. So triacontane is one of those hydrocarbons with greater than 20 carbons that are going to come out at the very bottom of the distillation tower. And then you've got propane, which is one of those refinery gases having between one and four carbons. And you also see the melting and boiling points for each of these three hydrocarbons. So at room temperature, about 25 degrees Celsius, which one of these is going to be a solid at 25 degrees? Which one is going to be a liquid? And then which one is going to be a gas at room temperature? Take a minute to think about that one. Any answers? I'm looking at our time. We're done with chapter six, no matter how far we get. Like I, I said, the more you participate, the more we get done. So take a look at pentane. Its boiling point is 35.9. That means it will not turn into a gas until it hits 35.9 degrees. So what will pentane be at 25 degrees? Will it be a gas? Well, I just said no, it won't. So either solid or liquid, which one will it be? Well, you got to look at the melting point. Pentane will only be a solid at temperatures lower than negative 130.5 degrees. So with that logic, what will pentane be? at 25 degrees, a solid, liquid, or gas. Very good, liquid. Thanks, Madison. What about triacontane? Its melting point is 65.8 degrees, but its boiling point isn't uh, very low at all. Its boiling point is very high, 449.7. So at 25 degrees, Will it be a solid? Will it be a liquid or will it be a gas? And then think about propane. Look at its boiling point. It has a very, very low boiling point. So try contain, thank you, Ian, will be a solid. Try contain will not be a liquid until it hits at least about 66 degrees. So at room temperature, 25 degrees, that's below its melting point. So Ewan is right, it will be a solid. And therefore, the propane with its very low boiling point, much lower than 25 degrees. So yes, at 25 degrees, it will be a gas. And so just to review our distillation column, separating hydrocarbons by distillation depends on which specific physical property. It's going to be boiling point. Remember we said the greater the number of hydrocarbons, the greater the number of carbons that a hydrocarbon has, the higher the boiling point. So therefore the distillation tower is going to separate the hydrocarbons based on their boiling point, which is dependent on the number of carbons.
that that hydrocarbon has. And so positions A, B, and D, that's your carbon one through carbon four. At B, you're going to have your carbon five through, I think it was five through 12, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, five through 12. At position C, and here is your reformer. And that's just going to convert everything to gasoline. And then at position D, that's where you have your asphalt. You're greater than 20 carbons. Like your asphalt comes out there. And then position C is going to be. That was your former. So it's before your cracker, that's going to be your diesel. And so we saw how the number of carbon atoms in the hydrocarbons at A, B, and D compare with the number of carbon atoms separated at position C. And I think I asked that twice. That's the same question as B. And so with the distillation, just be familiar with the principle that allows all of those different hydrocarbons to be separated. And that's based on boiling point and therefore the greater the number of carbons that a hydrocarbon has, the higher its boiling point. And so the uh, those hydrocarbons with greater than 20 carbons, those will uh, be separated at the hottest part of the distillation column because they have the highest boiling point and the hottest part of the column is at the bottom. The coolest part of the column is at the top and that's where those uh, hydrocarbons with the fewest number of carbons will be separated. So gasoline is very important or maybe the most important product of, of crude oil. And so over 87% of each barrel of gasoline of uh, crude oil, which is 42 gallons, is a barrel. 87% of each barrel is used for transportation and heating. So 87% of each barrel of oil is used for the purpose of transportation and heating. And transportation itself makes up about 50% of each barrel's usage. And so there's a large demand for gasoline. About half of every barrel of oil that we obtain, we use it for transportation purposes, for gasoline. And so we talked about the component of the fraction distillation tower called the reformer. And what that does is let me go back what the reformer does is takes those uh, carbon 5 through 12 containing hydrocarbons and transforms them so that they're all octane basically and in particular iso-octane, which is a particular isomer of octane, and we'll talk about that. Hopefully we'll get a chance to get to that. This other special piece of equipment is called the cracker, 
And what that does is takes these large carbon hydrocarbon compounds and breaks them down into smaller hydrocarbon compounds. And so that's that special device is called a cracker. And you can either have thermal cracking or catalytic cracking to break apart a very, very large hydrocarbon compound into smaller pieces. What the heat does, and it's extremely high heat, and you can, as we saw, the, the cracker is towards the bottom of the distillation tower, and that's going to cause the large hydrocarbon to uh, break apart into smaller pieces. And so that takes a lot of energy to keep that special part of the column at that extreme high temperatures, that cracker at extreme high temperatures. And so to alleviate the amount of energy costs of keeping that cracker at those high temperatures, another method for cracking is called catalytic cracking by using a catalyst. By using a catalyst, you can keep your cracker at a lower temperature and therefore you use less energy. And therefore you get the same result by using the catalyst. And so for example, if we have a hydrocarbon that's 16 carbons in content, and we use the extreme heat of the cracker, we can break it apart into a hydrocarbon with 11 carbons and then another hydrocarbon with five carbons. And then the reformer that's at the, towards the top of the tower, that reformer, it rearranges the atoms within the mixture of hydrocarbons, ranging between five and 12 carbons, and usually starts with a linear molecule, and then it goes about producing one with branches. So it changes linear hydrocarbons to to branched hydrocarbons. And so therefore what you're doing is making a different isomer. Isomers are molecules that have the same molecular formula, but the way in which the atoms are connected to each other or bonded to each other is different. And so I mentioned isooctane. That's one purpose of the reformer and the distillation tower is to take linear, the linear form of octane and convert it into a branched isomer of octane called isooctane. Isooctane is used as a gasoline additive and that's what prevents engine knocking. So the higher your octane rating means the higher your percentage of isooctane in your gasoline and that will be beneficial for high performance engines and to prevent engine knocking. And so here we have some hydrocarbons, methane, ethane, propane, and butane, uh, one carbon, two carbons, three and four carbons respectively. Their molar masses are shown. And so you can see butane has the larger molar mass of these four hydrocarbons. And so it also has the larger boiling point. So increasing molar mass, you get an increased boiling point. Now comparing 2,2-dimethylpropane, which is also called neopentane, which is branched, versus n-pentane, which is linear. They both have the same structural formula. They're both C5H12. So both neopentane and n-pentane has five carbons, 12 hydrogens. What's different about them is the way that the carbons and hydrogens are connected or bonded together. And so in just comparing the two, 
the branched one is more compact. The linear one has greater surface area. So therefore, the one with the greater surface area has the higher boiling point. So the greater the surface area, the greater the boiling point. Just like the greater the molar mass, the greater the boiling point, the greater the surface area, the greater the boiling point. So this next picture, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons. This is octane and it's linear. So we'll call, anytime we have the linear form of the alkane, you call it the N version, the N octane, because it's linear. This is iso octane. They both have eight carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and 18 hydrogens. But you can see the way in which the carbons and hydrogens are connected together differ. This is more compact. This one has greater surface area. So you would expect N octane to have a higher boiling point than iso octane. So we talked about octane ratings. N octane has a very, very low octane rating. Iso octane has an octane rating of 100. So your gasoline is composed of iso octane. So if you have a if you're buying 91 octane rating gas, it has 91% iso octane and 9% other stuff, which is probably mostly heptane and n octane. Other additives are added to gasoline like ethanol. Your gasoline may be 10% ethanol. Ethanol also helps prevent engine knock because it has an even higher octane rating than iso octane. This stuff, MTBE, methyl tertiary butyl ether, it used to be used as an additive, but I don't, I don't think it's not used much anymore because it's very toxic. So what we, what we have in this picture, each of these dark, the circles, these are carbons. And then the gray circles are hydrogens. So we see we have four carbons. So that means this is butane. C4H10, we got 10 hydrogens. So the structural formula we've got three of the carbons in a row. And then we've got a fourth carbon coming off of this third carbon. So there's the structural formula for this isomer of butane.
The other isomer of butane, so this is branched. The other isomer of butane is just going to be linear. So this is C4H10. And this is also C4H10. So this is going to be isobutane, the branched one. And this is going to be N-butane. This is the linear one. So we would expect this one to have the higher boiling point. Because it's linear, it has a greater surface area. Of course, this one is compact. It has smaller surface area. So the next question, we've got ethane, ethene, and ethanol. So ethane, it's got two carbons and six hydrogens, whereas ethene has a double bond. It has also two carbons, but only four hydrogens. And then ethanol also has two carbons. It has six hydrogens, just like ethane, but it also has an oxygen. So is ethane an isomer? I meant to say ethanol. Is ethane an isomer of ethanol? Well, no, they have different formulas. In order for two compounds to be isomers, they have to have the same chemical formula. They have to have the same number and the same types of atoms. The only thing different about them is the way the atoms are connected or bonded to each other. And the same thing will be true if I would have asked you, is ethane an isomer of ethene? The answer will be no. Ethene's formula is C2H4, whereas ethane is C2H6. So ethane has more hydrogens than ethane, so no, they would not be isomers. And here is a reaction that involves the process of, of cracking. And so you have a 16 carbon hydrocarbon being broken into two different pieces, one with five carbons and one with 11. So this C5H12, it follows our alkane formula, CNH2N plus two. May I remember that from a previous lecture. And so C5H12, N is five, So this is going to be pentane with five carbons, and it's an alkane. C11H22 follows the alkene basic formula when there's one double bond. So this has 11 carbons, so N is 11, and 2 times 11 is 22. So this would be an alkene with a double bond. So which bonds are broken and which are formed? Well, if you've got 16 carbons, fifteen and 16. So I've got 16 carbons here. 
And if I need to break this apart in two pieces, and C16H34, this is also an alkane. It follows that formula. 16 is N. 16 times 2 is 32, plus 2 is 34. So it follows the, the generic formula of an alkane. So all of these are single bonds. So this is carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So you could have a break here. has to be bonded to uh, four other atoms. So if your break happened here in the crafting process, oops, uh, there, here, after the fifth carbon, then would that give us C5H12? One, two, three, four, five. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And then we would have these eleven and twenty two. So that would give us our C five H twelve and our C eleven H twenty two. So which bonds are broken? You're going to have a CC single bond broken. And then what bonds have to get formed? Well, we have to be forming an alkene here. So therefore, you've got to have a C double bond C and you've got to have a CH bond broken here as well in order to have that 12 hydrogen that will come over. And then you have your double bond form. The other bonds, CH bonds, they stay. And so to calculate the energy change, you need to go back to this table and do the bond energies. A CC double bond is 598. And it's formed, and so that's negative. Then over here, you got a CC bond broken and a CH bond that has to get broken and that hydrogen has to be relocated to the five carbon piece. So a CC bond and a CH bond, a CC is 356, a CH is 412. And so you add those together. So remember, bonds broken is endothermic, always positive. Bonds formed is exothermic, so it will always have a negative charge. And bonds formed, negative 598. And so the energy change is just the sum. And so it's going to be a positive number. 
And remember, this is not a combustion reaction. This is just basically a decomposition reaction, in other words. And so, another catalytic process that has been done is taking coal and reacting it with hot steam to produce a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen gas that's called water gas. Now, before the petroleum revolution, this water gas was used to do things like uh, uh, heat street uh, to uh, provide energy, the energy to uh, to light street lights, and the very first stop uh, uh, stop lights were powered using water gas, as well as the first street lights. And then this water gas was further used in what was uh, called the, what, it, what is called the fischer troeltz process and is used to make more gasoline. So this is an alternative way to make gasoline by taking the water gas and using a catalyst to make larger hydrocarbons. So your products are hydrocarbon and water using a catalyst to convert the water gas into a hydrocarbon. And the most popular one that they want to make, of course, is octane. And so the catalyst makes this reaction possible. Without using a catalyst, this reaction wouldn't go because it's too slow on its own. And so therefore, what that means by being too slow is the activation energy is just too high. And so what the catalyst does is lowers the activation energy that's required for the reaction to proceed in the forward direction. And so the catalyst causes the reaction to proceed faster than it would if the catalyst was not used. And so basically the fischer trope process converts coal into gasoline. And so this is uh, called an energy profile diagram. With energy on the y-axis and reaction pathway on the x-axis. The green graph is an uncatalyzed reaction, and therefore you have a very large activation energy without the catalyst. With the catalyst, which is the blue graph, you have a very small activation energy. And that's the whole purpose of the catalyst is to lower the activation energy, and that makes the reaction go faster. You get to products much faster. And so, and I forgot, so this is basically the reaction I forgot to copy and paste. So the fischer tropes reaction Takes your water gas, which is a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen, and your products are hydrocarbon and water. So when N is one, then you have three, two times one is two plus one is three.
So you're making methane. And so when N is one, that means you're producing methane. And so therefore, the heat that's evolved by the reaction is going to be um, equivalent to the heat of combustion of methane. And so if you have larger hydrocarbons, you're going to get less energy that is produced by the reaction because of the fact that the larger the hydrocarbon, the higher the boiling point, and so the smaller the heat of combustion. And so therefore, if you think about the reaction in reverse, if you're breaking down the methane, methane is going to be able to uh, produce more heat than a larger hydrocarbon. And so we are almost out of time. The last two sections of notes our quick uh, notes on ethanol, which is a source of biofuel that comes from uh, biological sources like trees or grasses or agricultural crops like corn. And ethanol is used as an additive in, in lots of gasolines because it has a high octane rating. And ethanol therefore oxygenates your hydrocarbon fuel because ethanol is an alcohol that contains oxygen. And then the last little section is based on what we did in lab last week. Uh, just a review of what we talked about last week about biodiesel and the basic transesterification reaction, same one that we looked at last week in lab. Okay. And so what I'll do with these sets of questions here is I will. Um, Post, uh, let's see, the thing, I can't email you this file. It's going to be able to tell me it's too large. Uh, the thing with eLearn email, you can only email files that are a certain size. But what I will do is I'll post uh, my annotated notes for um, Chapter 6 in a news item. I do believe I can do that. If I can't do it in a news item, if that's too large, I'll just post them in eLearn under the course content. Uh, where the uh, empty shell uh, chapter six notes are, I'll also put my annotated notes. That means notes that I've written all on like this. So I'll, I'll upload this to the course content tab right where you downloaded the empty shell uh, notes. And that way you'll have the answers uh, to the few questions that are left that we don't have time to get to. So those two questions in section 615 on ethanol, and then there's one question in section 6.16 on biodiesel, and I will upload my notes to the course content tab so that you can have access to the solutions to those two questions. Are you talking about just the regular chapter quizzes that you get three attempts on? The way eLearn does it, not, not eLearn, I'm sorry. The way Connect does it is a person, who is, let's say a student that made 100% on the quiz, their first attempt, they get 100%. But if it took you two attempts to score 100%, you don't get the full 100% there's a small penalty for having to take it a second time to get a perfect score, if that makes sense. So uh, it's not the highest attempt. It's, it's not exactly the highest attempt or the lowest attempt. 
Uh, it depends on if it takes you three attempts to get 100, get all questions correct, then your grade will be a little bit lower than uh, if it would have taken you only two attempts. And so therefore there's a small penalty for uh, having to use more than one attempt to get all of the questions correct, but it's not a big penalty. Yes, I do believe it tells you the percentage. Thanks, Madison. Did that answer your question, Cameron? Now, the way uh, final grades are calculated, I think your lowest homework grade is dropped. And I think your two lowest chapter quiz scores are dropped. So you have a little wiggle room. If you didn't do so well on a couple of the quizzes this semester, then it won't hurt you. Your lowest two quizzes are dropped. Any other questions? So again, uh, over the the week, I'm going to, I think probably by Friday or Saturday, I'll have two short lectures on chapter seven posted. The first lecture I would like for you to watch and download the chapter seven notes uh, before you watch the, the videos that I'm going to, to post uh, under course content chapter seven and then uh, bring your notes uh, to lecture meeting with you next week. And then we're going to spend our two remaining class days next week just answering questions and working problems in Chapter 7. Uh, and you will be able to follow along great as long as you watch the videos before class. So I'll be sending you a reminder of that um, either Friday or Saturday, letting you know those videos are available and I will have the chapter seven note packet as well as the videos up by Friday or at the latest Saturday. And again, download the notes before you watch the videos. And as you're watching the videos, you can kind of make additional additional notes and following along with me. I'll be doing maybe uh, one example problem or question per section, and then I'll leave the remaining problems for us to do together in class. So if you don't have any more questions, uh, have a great holiday weekend. And above all, of course, be safe. And we will meet again on November 30th, a uh, week from today.